It's the Mike Francesa Podcast on the Bet Rivers Network. Hello again, everybody, and welcome to the Mike Francesa Podcast, betrivers.com. Again, you can uh, find us wherever you uh, go for your podcasts. Round two in this year's Triple Crown. You heard me earlier talk about how disappointed I was and how much I feel that the connections let the sport down by not sending a healthy and able Derby winner to the Preakness, which I believe is your absolute responsibility as a horse owner. And I'm not trying to manage somebody else's horse, far be it for me to do that. But if the horse is not sick and is not ill, to me, when you go to the Derby and you get the big paycheck and you get everything that comes to you from the Derby, fame and fortune, there comes some responsibility and the Derby winner should be there. He's not. It takes a lot from the race. There's a filly in the race, which always juices things up a little bit. There's not a lot of storylines in this race. There's not a lot of talent in this race. There's a couple of pretty good horses in this race. Nothing wonderful in this race. But they're going to conduct the Preakness Saturday at Pimlico. And then it's on to what should be a more competitive and more interesting Belmont. But racing took another very big hit here. Still, as we always do... We will analyze both the Preakness and the Black Eye Susan with the best guy in the business with Brad Thomas right after. Email the Mike Francesa podcast. Drop Mike a note at mikefrancesapodcast at gmail.com. Welcome back, everybody. It is uh, time for the second leg of the Triple Crown, the Preakness this weekend. Also, we'll give you some thoughts or Brad will on the Black Eyed Susan. A tough time for racing because clearly the Preakness has taken a severe hit a severe hit uh, with the Derby winner not here, and I've already spoken my piece on that on a past podcast. Brad, welcome. How are you? I'm great, Mike. How's it going? Brad, let's go back to the Derby for a second, okay? Um, no question, a brilliant ride, a talented uh, training job. But i got to be honest, I wasn't impressed by Epicenter. I wasn't impressed by Chad's horse. Uh, I thought they both hung. I thought they both had great chances to win the race to, after a very fast pace. Uh, the winner was the only horse that was really moving forwardly uh, with any pace. Uh, your thoughts as you size up the race? Well, the winner, Rich Strike, certainly benefited by the, from the pace meltdown. Uh, Zandon was the horse who I would truly say had no excuse whatsoever. That horse set a great trip benefited completely by the pace, didn't lose a lot of ground, just really hung on the money. Uh, at the center, I'll give more credit to. Uh, one of the things that we talked about with him was the uncertainty of whether or not he would be able to sit further off the pace than he usually does, uh, because we expected the pace to be, to be quick, maybe not quite as quick as it was, but he really showed great versatility and professionalism sitting so far back. He still was able to weave his way through traffic, he still punched hard. He put away challenges. Uh, I give him a lot of credit. Uh, I would acknowledge, though, he's not a superstar. He's just a really nice horse, maybe the best horse in the crop right now based on what he's done, but certainly a horse who's vulnerable to other horses stepping up and improving. Uh, as far as the ride, it was a truly Hall of Fame ride. It was a Dr. great Leon. ride, an absolutely great ride. It really was. In fact, uh, people... Afterwards, they didn't see this, but Arado Ortiz, who rode Mo Donegal, did not have his silks on after the race. And the reason why was because Sonny Leon pulled them off him during the race. Because <laughs> Sonny Leon beat Arado Ortiz to the key spot in that race. I'm not saying Mo Donegal was going to win. I don't think he was going to, but he had a shot to be third. But Sonny Leon moved before Arado Ortiz, and he saved ground and hit the inside hole. And that was the difference. Instead, Arad Ortiz hesitated, chose to wait, and then instead of following Leon, swung all the way out. And swinging so wide from so far back meant he had absolutely no chance to win the race. All right, so we're left with no derby winner in the race, which, again, I've already spoken my piece on it. He should be there. He's not. I can't, uh, I can't train somebody else's horse. But I think there's a responsibility when you win the derby. But we move on. Epicenter is going to be the favorite, probably a heavy favorite. 
Let's start with him in the field of nine. Uh, he draws a post eight. How about Epicenter? Well, he's one of the likely, one of the two likeliest winners for sure. Uh, I love the way he was able to rate in the Derby. Uh, he ran well without being able to withstand the last run. Rosario rode him brilliantly. In fact, Rosario to me is the best American style jockey in the world. He rides any type of horse. He understands race flow. He has fantastic steering ability. He's a super strong finisher. He's a big, big benefit to Epicenter again on Saturday. Uh, Steve Asmussen, Epicenter's trainer, loves the timing of the Louisiana Derby relative to both the Derby and the Preakness. It gives him tons of time before the Derby, and that time it makes the quicker turnaround for the Preakness a live thing for his horses. Witness his uh, Midnight Bourbon last year, who really wasn't a top flight horse, but he was able to come back in two weeks for the, from the Preakness uh, after the Derby and finish second. Uh, and Asmussen understands the patterns of rest that these modern horses need and that modern trainers need to develop them. Uh, still, I think it's going to be very, very hard for Epicenter to run quite as well as he did two weeks ago. That was an all-out effort. He was gave everything he had for the last quarter of a mile, repulsing multiple challenges until he got nailed late. He's going to have to face a fresh and high-quality foe from a top, top barn. Uh, how Rosario rides is going to be key, too. His timing is going to be really, really important because if Rosario waits too long to attack a speed horse like early voting, early voting is going to be gone. Uh, if he moves too aggressively to go after early voting, early voting is a really good horse. He might take enough out of his horse and out of early voting to make them both vulnerable to another horse having a career day. I think Epicenter is going to run really well, but I think he's vulnerable because of that two-week turnaround. All right, the other horse, early voting, uh, Son of Gun Runner, second in the Wood Memorial, um, got, you know, has the requisite speed that you like at the Preakness. How about uh, Chad Brown with early voting? The big time chance. This is a high, high quality speed horse, Mike. It's just really a question of distance. But as a later developing athlete, lightly raced, he's in the absolute most expert hands in the American racing game today. He beat two next out Gulfstream maiden winners in his debut at Aqueduct going a mile, then was rested 49 days, stretched out to nine furlongs in the withers, set a very fast pace, strung out the field, uh, beat the subsequent rebel winner, Unoho, and two other horses who came back to run second in stakes races. That was a pretty good race for the winter at Aqueduct. Then early voting waited 63 days, before running again in the wood. I think there was never an intent to run in the Kentucky Derby with this horse. Maybe if he won the wood by six, they would have been forced to go. But I think the intent all along was to wait for the Preakness. Zandon was the Derby horse. Early voting was going to be the Preakness horse. He took early pressure in the wood, cleared off, was only run down by the perfect trip, Mo Donegal, who had more seasoning, came back to run a very decent fifth in the Derby. Now, I think that early voting did not quite stay the mile and eighth that day. I thought he tried hard, but I thought in the last hundred yards or so, he kind of let go. Now, that could have been a function of just not a lot of seasoning, could have been a function of, of the 63 days between starts, or it could have been a function of he's just not quite a mile and an eighth horse. The pedigree says a mile and three sixteenths should be fine, but... If he gets pressure in the Preakness, I think he could be vulnerable, too. I see him clearing off. I see him running a lights-out race. But I still have a little bit of a question whether or not he can get this distance strongly. The story, other than the Derby winner not being there, is going to be the Philly being there. And also the Philly that is trained by the legendary... uh, octogenarian uh, Wayne Lucas secret oath has decided I think wrongly to go to the Preakness I would have gone back and tried to win the Philly triple crown Um, they decided to come to the Preakness Uh, first of all on the decision what's your thoughts and what's her chances 
I think she's a contender by default because this field lacks quality depth. I don't think she's good enough to win. Uh, I admire the spirit of uh, what the connections are doing. Uh, this is a game where to determine champions, you're supposed to reach for the stars. I like that they uh, compete. I just don't think she's good enough myself, and I, I think she could have been a Philly Triple Crown winner. She, I, I think the big question for her, besides the quality, besides running against males, is whether or not she will prove to be the same Philly on the East Coast as she was in the Midwest. Her dam was a Midwestern horse. Secret Oath has dominated on those tracks against very limited competition. I don't think she's really improving. I think that maybe now is the best time for her to really take the big shot because I think there's going to be Phillies who are going to be beating her uh, in the second half of the season. Uh, the competition she faced in Oakland was not good, and she had some things in her favor in those races. Four back, she had an outside bias. Three back, she was aided by another bias. In the Arkansas Derby, she did have some legitimate trouble against males, but she did get plenty of pace, too. Made an excellent middle move in that race before flattening out. But the horses who were 1-2 in their Cyber Knife and Barber Road, they're hardly the best of the division. Maybe they're second raiders at best. Uh, I thought Secret Oath really showed how tough she was by winning the Kentucky Oaks. Uh, she got first run on a very conservatively ridden nest in that race finished strongly, uh, showed how hickory she is, but she has to come back in two weeks rest, and she has a lot of races under her. She's going longer. She's facing males. Uh, as I said, she's a contender by default because I don't like a lot of the males in here, but she has always regressed in the past off her A-figure race, even with more rest than the 15 days she has here. Uh, I think, though, this is the time to take the shot because I think in the second half of the season on East Coast tracks against improving rivals, male or female, she's going to be vulnerable. All right, there's a field of nine. Let's go through the rest of them and give me a quick thought. Simplification who finished fourth in the Derby. Versatile and consistent uh, was an underrated overlay in the Derby at 35-1. to 1. He was really super in the Florida Derby. He fought uh, tag team pressure, put away Classic Causeway, uh, the Tampa Bay Derby winner, put away Papa Cop, who came back to run second in the uh, Pat Day of Churchill, uh, then fought hard against White of Barrio, uh, did it on a dull rail. His Kentucky Derby showed his versatility. He was able to rate, made a good middle move, was pace aided, but still very wide, continued gamely, wasn't good enough. I still don't think he's good enough. He's a contender by default. I like the jockey change, though, the John Velasquez and the rail draw. He will sit mid-pack instead of far back. He can be very tactical. I think he has a great chance to be on the board, but I think the mile three sixteens is probably a little bit long for him, though the cutback does help. doesn't have a whole lot of room to improve, uh, to me at least. We're talking with Brad Thomas about the Preakness this Saturday. Creative minister who obviously has shown nothing to belong in this race. No, I agree with you. Some people like this horse, Mike. I don't. Uh, he did improve second and third out with two turns and with Lasix, but he loses Lasix for the Preakness. He got good setups and trips, beating those uh, very average maiden and optional ads. And the horse field. has never been in a stake he, race. What, what, what's that, Mike? The horse has never been in a stake race. No, no, no. And uh, he, the, even the maidens and the allowance horses he beat were not stellar maidens and other than allowance horses. Uh, he comes back quick. He's done a lot of improving in a small period of time. I don't see another improvement against better going longer. Fenwick. Another one with no shot. He uh, freak breaking is made in the Tampa Bay two back with blinkers on, but all three of the two turn dirt races that day were won by early speed or close to the pace. Uh, also aided by the very soft fractions, by the fact that the heavy favorite in that race got an excessively wide trip. Uh, Fenwick faltered badly on the dull rail in the bluegrass without Lasix. I don't see him matching up with uh, the grade one pace folks he's going to meet here, going a mile three sixteenths without Lasix. As I bring in Happy Jack, who showed nothing in the Derby uh, and is back for this, let me ask this, Brad. Did you feel there was anybody in the Derby who had a major excuse? I thought it was actually one of the cleanest derbies I've seen in a long, long time. The only horses who had excuses were horses who were, who were pace involved. 
but they finished so far back, it's hard to say how well they really would have run. Uh, Trip-wise, I think most of the horses who had legitimate chances got about as good a trip as you could possibly expect in a field that size. Okay, Happy Jack, how about Happy Jack coming back for the from the Derby? No chance. Puts blinkers back on. They've been on before. It's not going to matter. He was pace eight at breaking his maiden uh, in his debut, going six furlongs in California against the weak field. He's been non-competitive since stretching out and trying great at stakes uh, races. I don't see why anyone could expect that situation to change on Saturday. Oh, Magnet. This horse is going to be one of the key horses in the race, and it's not because he has a chance to win, because he does not. He has a late developing pedigree on both sides. He might be a better horse in the second half of the year than he is now. But his best two races have been with Lasix and when he's been able to clear small and weak fields and set soft paces on speed-favoring surfaces. He's had everything his own way. Now he comes back in 13 days off a lifetime best with no Lasix, running an eighth of a mile further. Now, the reason why it's a factor here is he's going to affect early voting. And how well early voting runs and lasts is going to affect the outcome of this race. Our Magnac is outside early voting. When he won the race in California last week, uh, he was, or two weeks ago, he was hustled a little bit out of the gate to make the lead. It seemed like this horse, when he makes the lead, when you turn him on out of the gate, it's very, very hard to turn him off. He wasn't rank. He wasn't really pulling. But you can see this horse was a free-running horse who enjoyed doing that. So the strategy for Amagnac is going to be really key. Are these connections really trying to send this horse to clear early voting to do what the horse really wants to do and take their shot to win the race? Or are they willing to use their outside post to set off early voting and say, okay, let's see what we can get. Maybe we can be second. Maybe we can be third. Maybe we can for- be fourth. Now, the other complicating factor is who is on early voting. Jose Ortiz. Who's on our Magnac? His brother, Arad Ortiz. Now, Arad Ortiz also rides a lot of horses for Chad Brown, who trains early voting. So there's a lot of things going on here, and it's going to be very, very hard to predict exactly what the interaction between those two horses turns out to be. Now, I think early voting can shrug off Armagnac, given Armagnac is a hard send, but I think that Armagnac is good enough to hang in there for three quarters of a mile to make early voting vulnerable late to a rallier. So to me, this is the key question in this race. We'll know three strides out of the gate the answer to it, but it does make handicapping hard. In a race like this, that's going to be very strategic in which the two favorites are going to be short prices and very, very hard to separate and very, very hard to get out of the gimmicks. Skippy Longstocking. This horse is a grinder who can sit mid-pack. He doesn't have to come from last, and that's important. He has some tactical foot. Uh, His best two career races have come on the stretch to nine furlongs in his last two. I think another 16th is going to help him even more. He was paced meltdown aid when he won that other than allowance at Goldstream uh, two starts back. He was decisively only third best in the wood last time, but he got the third best trip that day. He made multiple runs. He kept on trying. He's really not a grade one horse. He's maybe a grade two horse, certainly a grade three horse, but he has 42 days between starts. The ideal time for modern horses and modern trainers. He has been pointed for this race by Safi Joseph, one of the up-and-coming stars of rising trainers. Joseph had what a barrio for the Derby, a horse who had more rest coming into that race than Skippy Longstocking would have had, a better horse than Skippy Longstocking. Uh, Wider barrio was wide, didn't get anything in the Derby. Now it's Skippy Longstocking's turn, and this is why Safi Joseph, one of the reasons why Safi Joseph is a good trainer. He has his weakest horse, a good horse, but his, his lesser horse for the lesser race. The one that always comes up lesser every single year because not only, I mean, this year it didn't get the Derby winner, but all the time, many horses that run well in the Derby who should run back in the Preakness, just like the winner of the Derby should, the, some of the losers should be running back as well, they skip 
the Preakness. So an astute trainer with his second best horse is going to say, hey, it's the Preakness I'm going to point for. Now, Skippy Longstocking is well-rested. He's a true distance horse. I think he's poised to run a career best. I think this horse is the snake in the grass in the Preakness. This is the horse who's not the obvious contender who is really going to run. Just a question of whether he's good enough. Um, now to the uh, race itself. It's it's not a great betting race. It's only nine horses, and you're going to have two horses that just look like they're better than the field, right? They are. It's going to be hard to get early voting and uh, a percent of both beat. Uh, I think early voting is a tad the likeliest winner, and he's not going to be the favorite. I just like Chad Brown in these situations where he's really able to put a target on the calendar and point a developing horse for the race. Uh, I don't think early voting is going to be seven to two. I think he's likelier to be five to two. Uh, maybe he's a win bet at seven to two or a hard three to one at five to two. I don't think so. I can't bet that percent of the win at four to five. Uh, to me, the key thing for me is I'm going to try to get Skippy Longstocking involved. Uh, he's certainly a win saver at the very least at 15 to one or more. If I see rallyers having a fair chance on the Pimlico dirt on Saturday, I might make a legitimate win bet on him because I really think this horse is going to run. He's not as good as the other two, but he's the one that's coming up to this race and could be set up. Uh, certainly the way I will play it beyond any win action with Skippy Longstocking is going to be using him in tries and supers with the two favorites and then plugging in in the other slots, simplification and secret oath. Basically, to me, this is a five-horse race. I'm saying that there's only five horses who can be in the paying slots of the gimmicks, and it's just a matter of how high the prices finish. I'm going to try to get Skippy Longstocking to be one of the higher finishing prices and combine him with the favorites and uh, simplification and secret oath. Any thoughts on the uh, Black Eyed Susan? I like favor in the Black Eyed Susan, Mike. Uh, she's improving, well-rested. Her best career race came in her stakes debut at the fairgrounds. That was without Lasix. She'll be without Lasix uh, on Friday for the Black Eyed Susan. And remember, it's going to be hot at Pimlico over the weekend. So horses who are unproven without Lasix could be especially vulnerable. Horses who have done well without Lasix, especially in hot climates like Florida, there are horses to pay attention to. Now, Favor ran very well when pace compromised against Echo Zulo, the two-year-old champion, Philly last year, who ran well in the Kentucky Oaks. I really think more maturity, more time for a late developing pedigreed horse like Favor and the stretch to Amman 316 is going to help her a lot. And in race 11, Mike, the very one on Friday, pay attention to the sixth uh, can the queen who uh, ran very well against mail time and is going to enjoy the cutback versus Philly and mares on giving ground. Uh, the other thing, Brad, is a good point. It's going to be in the 90s, as a matter of fact. So it's going to be very warm, and it, it, that will clearly impact the horses. It, it, the horses clearly are impacted in that kind of heat, especially when they see it for the first time all year, and that's what's going to happen on Saturday. Uh, a thought on the Belmont. The horses that, have, including the Derby winner, who have passed and moved to the Belmont and are targeting the Belmont, which is a lot of the horses in the Derby, uh, including the Derby winner, which has obviously caused a lot of uh, consternation and criticism. Um, your thoughts looking ahead as to what, if any of those stand out to you as you look forward to the Belmont? I agree with you about Rich Spirit. He should have run in the Preakness, if only because of the responsibility to the industry. Absolutely. But I think he should have run in the Preakness because that was his best shot. This horse has no chance in the Belmont. He's going a got. Mile he's got. He's, he's going to be a mile out of it, and you. And we all know that's not how you win the, the Belmont Stakes. Right. He, you're not going to get the fractions he got in the Derby and the early pressure that the leaders put on themselves in the Derby in the Belmont. Uh, I mean, perhaps he just was so worn out that they didn't feel he could come back in two weeks. But the thing is, his shot was the Preakness. Absolutely. Right. Yeah, these horses who run well in the Derby. Many times they can come back in the two weeks. That's their chance. Yeah, as and, far as and the Belmont, the, 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 he's got to strike the gold profile, this horse. 
he 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 really does. He's not he's not as good. Right. And who knows what type of trip he's going to get? And you could also make a case that he's a Churchill dirt horse because he broke his maiden at Churchill as a two year old uh, in a maiden claimer by many lengths. So there's a lot of reasons why he's not going to run at Belmont. Uh, and I think the distance is is just one of them. All right. Thanks, Brad. Good. Uh, enjoy the racing. We'll talk to you soon. Thank you. Take care, guys. Good being on. Thank you, Brad. Brad Thomas on the Preakness, and it's not much of a race. I got to be honest with you. We know that the Belmont will be a better race, and I agree with Brad. The Derby winner, I don't think, has much of a shot. Uh, again, a lot of times a horse that comes out of nowhere like that and doesn't have a great, de- a great resume and upsets the apple cart in the uh, Derby is not a horse that usually chalks up a lot of wins the rest of the year. I mean, it's not usually the case, and I think that will be the case uh, on this win. I think it will eventually be proven that it was a fluky win. But, again, one of the great rides in the history, I think, of the Kentucky Derby. That's how positive it was. We'll wrap things up right after this. You're listening to the Mike Francesa Podcast on the Bet Rivers Network. Just a word on the Rangers after game one. And to me, again, I'm not giving you a scouting report on Carolina. That's the first time I've seen Carolina all year. But knowing what I could find out about Carolina from hockey folks and, and looking at them, we know that they were considered the better, deeper team. But this game was a complete reversal of the last series where the Rangers at times didn't play that well and somehow survived. In this series, I thought... In game one, the Rangers played well, outplayed their opponent for most of the game, and didn't get the win. So this is not a great dynamic going forward in this series for the Rangers because they outplayed their opponent on the opponent's ice in game one and came up without a W. That's not that's a very big positive for Carolina and a very big negative, I think to the fortunes of the Rangers going forward because they did play a very strong game and came up without a W. And that's why, conversely, it was almost the opposite of what we saw a lot in the Pittsburgh series. So let's see what that means for the Rangers. The one thing I will say is there is clearly a grit and a tenacity in this Ranger team that you really like. It's a young team. It's a team that... We know there's a lot of young players who are going to get very, very valuable experience here. They have some good players who are going to have to step it up, as they did at times in the Pittsburgh series. And I would not be surprised if they play some very good games and get some Ws at home. But that was not a great game one in terms of role reversal from what happened in the past series. We'll see you soon. Thanks for listening to the Mike Francesa podcast on the Bet Rivers Network.